Hey guys, how's it going? This is Waj, and in this video, we're showing you how to build your own custom PC. Now, of course, there's billions of guides out there describing how you can make your own computer since probably before the internet was ever made. But uh, this video, we're going to specifically talk about how to make your own Hackintosh friendly custom PC. Now, of course, you can use this to make a great computer for Windows or Linux or any real OS you want, but specifically we chose hardware that works really well with running Mac OS X, the latest version of it. And uh, we're going to go through the installation guide in another video. And uh, But in this video, we're going to specifically focus on the individual installation of actually physically installing all these different parts together to form one simplistic really affordable mini Hackintosh. Uh, I'll go through some of the parts that I've chosen and we'll go through some of the reasons why I've chosen those parts for this Macintosh friendly PC. Now one of the most important fundamental parts that you're going to need to understand, do a little research about, is the motherboard itself. Now I've specifically chosen this Z77N Wi-Fi motherboard, uh, which is a mini ATX motherboard. It really is probably one of the better motherboards that you can get that runs Mac OS X quite well. You really don't even need to install any drivers uh, to make everything kind of work. And But this specific one has been tested and uh, there's a whole bunch of guides out there on what specific parts work really well with running Mac OS X. Specifically, if you go to Tony Max 86's blog, you'll find all those custom builds that people have tested and they work really great. But this one is really the most robust and probably the most affordable motherboards that you can get out there for running Mac OS X. Specifically, it has USB 3.0, a full PCI expansion slots. You can put any uh, Ivy Bridge processor in here, any 1155 basically processor and a really flexible choice and uh, this one is about hundred and nine dollars. Now no computer would ever run without a CPU of course and this is going to be determined by your budget. If you whether you're getting a Core i7, Core i5 or Core i3 uh, really depends upon how much you are willing to spend. Now I'm choosing 1155 socket and I've chosen the base model of the Core i3 line which is the 3225 and it really works well with my budget budget and that's what I've chosen. Next, of course, we're going to need a hard drive of some sorts. Now, I'm on a pretty tight budget. I've actually recycled one of my own hard drives. It's an old Western Digital 250 gigabyte hard drive. So that was technically kind of free for me. But you can put in an SSD. You can put in multiple hard drives. You can go crazy with hard drives. And of course, that'll be determined by your budget and your needs. But I'm going to go with a standard, pretty slow 250 gig hard drive for my budget. Next, we're definitely going to need some RAM. Now, I'm using just a single stick of 4 gigabytes of DDR3 from Crucial. Now, you can get more uh, depending upon how much you can fit in your motherboard and, of course, how much your budget has to allow. But I'm going to go with 4 gigs. And compatibility these days is pretty good with a lot of different brands from different motherboards. But you can always double check by researching your motherboard and what specific RAM works really well with the motherboard. For graphics, that's really going to be determined on your needs. If you do a lot of gaming, video editing, a lot of graphic intensive applications, you might want to think about a dedicated graphics card, of course, and there's lots of choices available for you in that regard. I, again, I want a tight budget and my needs would work fine with the integrated graphics that's available on the CPU itself. And the nice thing about the current generation Intel processors, they have pretty good accelerated graphics internally. So I'm going to stick with that. Now, the case that we're going to be using is a BitPhoenix Prodigy, which is a case that that has been around for a while now and it looks like a little Mac Pro. It definitely has that Apple feel. One of the cool things about this case is that it has a whole bunch of options for you to upgrade later on in the future. So you can put SSDs onto its toolless drive base. You can also put a whole bunch of standard 3.5 inch hard drives and you can even put SSDs on the side door as well as having the ability to fit a full size graphics card inside this pretty compact package. And if that wasn't already enough, you could even put a full-size dual 120 millimeter radiator on the top of the case for extreme water cooling. 
Now, of course, we're going to need some kind of power supply unit to get everything powered up nicely and to run fine. One of the important things you want to think about when you're thinking about buying a power supply is whether you're going to upgrade some parts later on in the future. You want to make sure you have enough wattage so you're covered throughout the lifespan of your PC. So a great resource to kind of research on how much you'll need in terms of power. Uh, I've provided a link in the first link below where you can actually calculate the exact amount of power that you're going to need uh, for your power supply. So you can enter in your specific CPU, what kind of motherboard you're using, how many fans, how many hard drive, etc, etc. So when you hit the calculation button, it'll give you two values. One is a minimum kind of range, and one is a recommended range. And usually you definitely want to follow the recommended range. Right now we're looking at about 163 watts, and uh, most likely you're going to get a power supply that's around 250, just to be on the safe side. Now here I've calculated the scenario if I get a high-end graphics card installed in the system like a GTX 680 or something equivalent, I'll need about 354 or more on the power supply unit. Uh, I would definitely get uh, something around 450 to 500 in this regard. And considering all those factors, I've chosen this 460 watt power supply from Cooler Master. Now this is not a great quality power supply, it's not 80 plus plus efficiency, but it'll still do and it's still pretty good. And for most of the time, I'm not going to be using like a dedicated graphics card. So it's kind of more than what I would need, but it's always good to have more just to be on the safe side. Now let's just do a quick overview on how much all this will cost once you get everything together. It's going to be about $405 based on some of the parts that I've chosen. Your pricing might be a little bit over or less dependent upon sales and things like that. And of course, this does not include any taxes or any shipping but overall this is about a $400 purchase okay so now we're ready to actually put everything together now before you touch any kind of electronic equipment it's important that you're safely grounded so you don't have any electrostatic discharge on sensitive electronic pieces of equipment so there's a number of ways you can do this uh, you can google and find out a whole bunch of easy methods of grounding yourself one method is just touching a metal part of your PC case connected to the power. Another great way is purchasing an electrostatic wrist strap, which is basically going to prevent any static electricity transferring from your hand to any sensitive piece of electronic equipment. Okay, so once you've grounded yourself properly, we're going to open the packaging for the motherboard. Now in there, you'll find a whole bunch of stuff. You'll find some SATA connectors, which are very important, of course, for connecting hard drives and optical drives. And you'll find a back I.O. plate as well as the manual with some drivers. Now in terms of drivers, when you're running OS 10, it's hard to use those. But if you're running those on a PC, you definitely want to get the latest ones from the Gigabyte website. I would also recommend taking a good look at the manual if you're unclear about any step of installing your motherboard. So definitely check that out. Now the first step that we're going to do is take out the motherboard from its electrostatic packaging and lay it flat on the box. After that we're going to open up our CPU which comes with the cooler which we are going to be using. And the nice thing about using the stock Intel cooler is that it already has the thermal compound already installed so you don't have to worry about that. Really simple and straightforward. And of course we'll get to installing the cooler onto the CPU in a second here. Now let's just head down to our CPU mount on our motherboard. Now, you basically want to release this lever by pressing down on it, and this whole thing will open and you can install your CPU. There's obviously a cover that we need to remove first. And once you have the cover removed, you'll be exposed to all the little pins and all the little connectors that are going to be physically attached to the CPU. So you just want to be really careful here. You don't want to get any dust or any kind of debris in that section. Now what you want to pay close attention to here is that there are two notches on the CPU and on the socket that match perfectly. And all you need to do to fit the CPU into the socket is just match those notches again perfectly. So you just drop it vertically down and uh, secure it again using the lever. And uh, again, be careful and uh, it should be fine. You really can't do too many things wrong over here. Okay, so our next step is to attach our CPU heatsink and fan 
to our motherboard. Now, it's a fairly straightforward job. Now, if you're unclear on installing the CPU heatsink and fan to the motherboard, you can refer to the manual that came with the CPU. Basically, you have four individual points that you want to connect to the motherboard. Each of these has a little lever that you can force down and turn. And when you look at the back of the motherboard, you'll see a little piece of plastic poking out. And you want to make sure that all four little points are poking out at a good amount and uh, you know you have it installed at that point and you could of course uh, double check these it, it takes a little bit of time to get all these four points in securely but you want to make sure that you have a good balance of force throughout the entire CPU so you don't run into any heat issues or anything like that Okay, so once you have securely mounted the CPU fan and heatsink to the motherboard, you just want to connect the CPU fan's power to the motherboard. And you usually find a CPU fan connector on the motherboard. It should be labeled and just connect the power of the fan to that connector. Next, we're going to install the RAM to the motherboard. We'll find two slots on this motherboard where we can connect to RAM. And you'll see two slots, one larger one and one smaller one. And it just basically corresponds to the RAM. So really, you can't fit it any way but that way. So it's fairly simple and straightforward. OK, so now what we want to do is install our input and output backplate onto the case itself. We'll take the input and output uh, plate over here. Usually it's quite sharp in the corners, so definitely be careful. I've definitely cut myself a couple of times on these sharp corners over here. But usually you just want to line it up uh, correctly of where the motherboard is going to be so you have the, all the connectors in the proper position. And once you have that positioning, you just want to push it through and it'll kind of lock by itself. And if you want to just uh, secure it using the handle of a screwdriver or anything, you can just make sure everything's flush and everything has gone through and it's all securely fastened to the case. Okay, so now we can finally install our motherboard onto our case. You'll see four little points of where you can screw in the motherboard so you want to just line it up and uh, make sure it's uh, connected to the IO plate and everything is kind of lined up and proper it takes a little bit of kind of finesse to get this in and properly lined up but once you get it in just go ahead and screw all those four screws in and once you have all those screws in, you've successfully installed the motherboard, the CPU, and RAM onto our PC. So we're halfway done. So we want to install our hard drive. Now we only have one hard drive to deal with, and we actually have a toolless system where we mount the hard drive. But you might have to use screws depending on your case. But our case is pretty simple. We just attach our toolless bay into our hard drive and uh, just install it. Pretty straightforward. Okay, so now we can install our power supply. Our power supply actually mounts at the bottom of the case, and we don't have a modular power supply. We actually went for the cheaper non-modular power supply. That's why it has a whole bunch of whack of cables at the back, but we basically have to do a little bit of wire management. But of course, the first thing that we have to do is make sure our power supply is securely attached to our case. We're using the screws that are usually provided either with the case or with the power supply. In my case, it came with the power supply. Okay, so now the first thing that we're going to connect the power supply to is the main power for the motherboard. Now this is pretty easy to spot. It's the biggest power connector on your power supply. And uh, you really just want to fit that in. And again, it kind of goes one way. It can only fit in one way. And uh, once you have that installed, we're going to connect our power supply to the CPU. And again, this power connector is usually located near the CPU and again you can spot that connector. In our specific case we're using a lower wattage CPU so it only takes a four pin connection. If you're using a higher end motherboard with a more powerful CPU it would take anything from a eight pin to a four pin. Next we're just going to connect our SATA power from the power supply to our hard drives. Now you would also use this for installing SSDs or even an optical drive. So this is a pretty important connector to know. 
The next thing we're going to do is connect our front panel headers. Now these are relating to the power switch, the restart switch, and the hard drive activity LED. And of course the best way to connect these directly onto the header on your motherboard is just to review the manual and give you the exact positioning of where all these three little connectors go and uh, it should give you a nice clear diagram so you shouldn't have any problems. The next thing we're going to need to connect is the HD audio connector, which is basically corresponding to the headphone and microphone jack located at the front of the case. And again, if you have trouble finding the connector for this on your motherboard, refer back to the manual. In my case, it was right by the PCI Express port on the motherboard. After that, we're going to connect our front USB connections to our motherboard. Now, thankfully, we actually have a USB 3.0 system, so it's actually using this nice thick blue cable, and uh, there's a nice big thick blue connector on the motherboard, so it's really simple if you get this motherboard. One of the last things that we're going to do is just connect our SATA data connector from our hard drive to our motherboard. We're going to connect it into one of the white available ports, which is actually a 6 gigabit port. Now our last step of the whole process is basically connecting all your system fans to the motherboard or to your power supply. You'll definitely see one of the fans that needs to be connected to the motherboard directly and uh, that's usually the, our rear fan and usually the front fans or any other auxiliary fans will be connected to the power supply either via Molex connectors or any other specialized fan connectors. Again if you're unclear about any of this stuff all this should be generally in your case manual or on your motherboard manual. But once you've done all of that, you, we now have a computer that is fully capable of running any operating system that you can throw at it, whether it's Windows 8, Linux, Android, whatever you want. But what specifically we're going to focus on, of course, installing Mac OS X Mountain Lion. So if you're interested in how we would install Mac OS X on this specific computer with this hardware, stay tuned till the end of the video. But that's really it guys, make sure to give us a thumbs up and favorite the video as well. If you have any comments or questions, make sure to, again to leave them down below. And to subscribe to our channel Majid Sayyid too. And one last thing, if you haven't checked out our website instafuse.com, make sure you do so whenever you have the time. So take care.